Last year, we listed on the ASX, uh, raising 10 million in an oversubscribed offer uh, to take our lead candidate, AD114, into the clinic. We really have this powerful uh, platform technology that can be used to identify eye bodies to treat a number of different diseases. Our initial focus is on fibrosis with the lead candidate, AD114. So what is an eye body? An eye body is a very small antibody incredible um, affinity and incredible specificity. And because it's got a big long loop, it seems to be able to get into areas of proteins that traditional antibodies can't get to. This technology is another league again. Okay, I think they have generated, from their CXCR4 data, uh, they've basically shown they can do it with GPCRs. Uh, I also, we don't need to get into which iron channels, but there's, got, there's some preliminary data with some other iron channels I've got into that, that says they, these can work on that as well. And if they can demonstrate the real selectivity and specificity that low molecular weight compounds can't do, they'll be basically unsuccessful. It opens up a phenomenal uh, I, I think at Alta has got some technology that allows undruggable targets now to be drugged. Lead compound, AD114. The lead candidate, I think uh, we've got evidence of efficacy in animal models of several different types of fibrosis. And I think it's uh, the novel mechanism of action that we, that we have here, I think, makes it a, a potential first-in-class uh, therapy. Fibrosis um, can occur in lots of different tissues, but it is a, a severe disease, and our initial focus is on lung fibrosis. So what is lung fibrosis? Well, you know, I talk to the patients talking about scarring of the lung, because that, in essence, is what it is. Uh, and the result of that to the lung is that the lungs become stiff uh, and they shrink in size. So our patients typically have lung volumes that are half the size of what they should be. Uh, and I use the analogy that the lungs are a little like bellows. We're forever breathing in and out, and these bellows are essentially halving in size and are becoming stiffing, stiff and require oiling. Uh, but uh, to date, we have no great uh, uh, therapies for this condition. What we're going to be talking about today is idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, and this is the most common of all of those 200 subtypes, and it represents over 50% of all patients who have form, uh, a form of lung fibrosis. But the commonest uh, uh, presentation we see is with this condition called IPF. Idiopathic meaning we don't know what caused it. We think that eventually the repair mechanism becomes dysfunctional, that you injure the lung so many times and that the hundredth time you injure the lung, it no longer heals in a normal way, it heals in a dysfunctional way. But these are not wonder drugs, that these conditions, this condition is still progressing, the lungs are still shrinking, you're not curing the condition, you're not even holding the condition, it is, you are still deteriorating, albeit at a less dramatic rate. So there remains a, an ongoing uh, clinical need for, for new therapeutics in this. Uh, the trajectory of this condition is that it's a terminal condition. I didn't make that point earlier, but you, from the point of diagnosis, most people are dead within three years. There is an unmet clinical need. The treatments, 2014 was a big year, but it wasn't big enough. We do have two drugs. They're not yet available in Australia, uh, but they are, there's certainly room for better uh, therapeutics. There's still a large me medical need, there's no doubt. I mean, perfenidone, the number of trials they tried to do to show success was over about 10 years. And there's still a group, there's still a large body of physicians believe perfenidone doesn't do anything. Uh, the the uh, Boringer compound came out of their oncology program. It's one of these multiple tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Uh, and you're not quite sure which one is the important tyrosine kinase. But the, if you look at the actual trials, that again the physician put up there, the, the dropout rate was quite amazing. It's a very high dropout rate in those uh, trials with the, uh, the tyrosine kinase. A kidney fibrosis eventually lead to chronic kidney disease and the ultimate of that kidney disease will be people ended up in dialysis. If you look at the census of um, NSH kidney disease over time in Australia and New Zealand, you can see that there is an increasing number of patients that ended up in NSH renal disease due to type 2 diabetes. The imbalance between this injury and the repeated natures of this has actually lead to uh, the bad things about the fibrosis. Like in patients that who have normal kidney uh, tissues and the biopsy tissue, as you can see here in the diabetic kidney, there's increased uptake and staining of the CXCR4. 
2030, there will be 5.4 million patients that who are going to be on dialysis. In fact, one in three Australians will have uh, more than 25 years, we have one risk factor or one clinical manifestation of kidney disease. There's unmet, unmet need for like new therapeutic options for kidney fibrosis. When we talk about fibrosis of the eye, what we're really talking about is scarring of the retina. If the retina, which is a very transparent neural tissue, it's filled up with lots of neurons that allow us to see, if that becomes white and opaque, then the cells in the retina can't pick up the light and therefore you cannot see. So fibrosis is basically any condition in the retina that leads to scarring. And of course, there are a number of different types of diseases can, that can do this. So let's talk about blindness in this country. This obviously also rep uh, represents the Western world and the United States and, and Europe. The, the, the largest cause of vision loss in our community is age-related macular degeneration. If you don't treat, you get scar. Yeah. If you treat, most patients respond, but then over time, 50% yeah. or 45% develop a scar, yeah. okay? Then there's another group that 25% who don't respond at all, they will develop scar. That tells you we need alternative targets and we need something that targets fibrosis and scarring that we can use in combination with VEGF. So there's two separate types of questions that need to be addressed. Even though this has been a game changer, we have a treatment now where we never had one before, there's still a need to, to get a, a, a new, new therapies. You know, fibrosis in the, in the eye, I think, is, is a leading cause of blindness. I think it is something we need to look at for wet AMD. It's something relatively new. So in other words, it's only a recognition in the last few years that wet AMD needs to have co-treatments or alternative mechanisms. I think this is now becoming more, more widespreadly sort of recognised. Uh, as I mentioned, there's, very, there's pretty much no treatments currently outside of the VEGF agents. Um, and there are some common, there is some commonality with some of the other forms of fibrosis around the body, such as the influx of immune cells. And so I think targets Targets that are efficacious in lung or kidney may well have some benefit in the eye um, if they are, for example, treated as a co-treatment with VEGF or if they do ha have indeed some anti-angiogenic uh, potential as well. So that's where we're, you know, we're working very closely with A-Delta because of the CXCR4 compound. And I think it certainly has had some uh, uh, very, very promising results in our animal models. So we've heard a lot about fibrosis today, how there is a considerable unmet medical need. And what we see in that space in all of these diseases is that our target CXCR4 is upregulated and that the eye body AD114 is having an effect. The transactions in this space tend to be quite unique. Um, pharma invests in a fibrosis drug and it can be applied in multiple areas. We've talked about the lung, um, the eye and the kidney. Um, and these deals that pharma are doing tend to be around 100 million up front uh, for a fibrosis asset at phase one um, with four to 500 million in milestone payments. Uh, so with our IPO funding of 10 million, we'll be in the clinic by early 2018 um, and looking for at the early commercialisation potential of this drug. Well, the real driving force uh, is uh, what you're trying to do for patients. Uh, working with the adult team uh, through scientific advisory board discussions and I've got to tell you it's, it's really interesting stuff that's going on, really, really exciting and uh, uh, it's a, a real pleasure to see uh, people in this part of the world uh, developing assets in areas of major unmet uh, medical need that look, look really, really good. So uh, I'm very happy to be here and to be part of the adult team.